nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Uh, so we have a, um, three saints for today. Uh, well, I guess nine, I suppose. But uh, So the, the, the feast is the seven holy founders. Uh, so seven men who founded the order of the Servites, and so we'll hear about them. But also two others, uh, St. Anthony uh, Kaulias and St. Benedict of um, An Anyane. Anyane. Uh, Some place in France. Uh, so we'll hear about the other two first. Uh, and all, all of them were, we could say, in a certain sense, uh, reformers. Uh, reformers of, of certain abuses. So St. Anthony uh, Kalias, he was a patriarch of Constantinople in the ninth century, and his uh, predecessor was the heretic uh, Photius. This is the one that was, the, this, is, this is the incident involving the, the great west, or not the great western, um, the schism between east and west uh, that, that split the orthodox from the Roman church. That was this, this um, controversy which had happened before St. Anthony Kalias um, uh, arrived. And so he presided over the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in uh, 869 and 870. And in this council, yeah, he condemned or reversed all the works of his heretical predecessor. Uh, so that, that shows that it's just because someone is a bishop or in the church or whatever, uh, they can't make egregious errors. And so um, St. Anthony Callias had to uh, clean up somebody else's mess, right? What, 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 uh, what, did, what did he not do? didn't complain, didn't, you know, blame other people, didn't say, oh, what was me? Why did I have to come into the church when everything's falling apart and it's not my fault? It was the, it was the last bishop. It was a bishop above me. We don't, we don't, we don't do that, right? You don't, you don't blame other people or point fingers. Uh, so uh, he was noted for his deep uh, personal prayer life, uh, his personal holiness, and the sanctity he brought to his office, right? So it's much more than uh, pronouncements, uh, that is going to change heresy. It's going to be that a, a personal example, uh, leadership by example. So um, uh, some good lessons to learn there from St. Anthony Kaulias. Uh, St. Benedict of um, An Anyane, uh, born, he was a Visigoth. This is going to be in the 8th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century. Um, he was educated and served in the court of King Charlemagne. So he was very known to the royal uh, um, family there. But he became a Benedictine monk, and he lived for two and a half years on bread and water alone, and slept on the bare ground, and would keep all night vigils, and would go barefoot everywhere. So uh, monasticism is declining at this time, and um, so in the year oh, seven, 779, uh, Benedict founded a monastery on his own land, and everyone there lived on bread and water, kept all night vigils, went barefoot, um, all the austerities he himself was doing. And the results were very sparse. I mean, he got some people uh, coming there, but that's a very hard way of life. That is not something that uh, most people are able to do. So he relaxed his austerities. He took the rule of St. Benedict and his monastery grew. He was really able to make, uh, make some progress. He, either ref he began reforming other monasteries, founding other monasteries, and he was seeing the success of the rule of St. Benedict. So uh, eventually, Charle one of Charlemagne's sons would become emperor, and he made Benedict director of all the monasteries in the empire. And so uh, uh, Benedict uh, would institute widespread reforms. Um, and he also, this is interesting, he kind of compiled a super rule for all the monasteries. Didn't matter what you were. He compiled a, a rule that every monastery was gonna follow, and this was called the um, Codex Regularum, and then he also published a Concordia Regularum. Concordia means of one heart. And he shows he took all the rules of other monasteries and lined them up with the rule of St. Benedict and showed them how the two um, uh, coincided, were together. Uh, so uh, he also instituted a reform of monastic life in terms of the liturgical character. He required daily mass, right? Which we might think, well, that's what monks do, not in every place. Uh, he made additions to the divine office. He also stressed um, a clerical element in monasticism. And this, uh, as opposed to um, the Benedictine, simply the Benedictine uh, ora et labora, work, um, pray and work, uh, it was a part of the work was not just um, digging in the fields, gardening and so on, but uh, teaching and writing as well. And he, his efforts had lasting effects on Western monasticism. Saint Benedict of uh, Anier, 
He is considered the restorer of Western monasticism and often called the second Benedict. Uh, but interestingly, his um, Codex Regulatum never really uh, took, took on. It, it, this attempt to impose the Benedictine or kind of a, um, an, over, an overarching rule for all the monasteries that just didn't ever uh, take on, uh, partly because uh, God does will the plurality of monastic orders. God wills, there's a reason we have Dominicans and Franciscans and Carmelites and Benedictines and, and nuns of the visitation because people are, are different. Right? People have all these different abilities, all these different um, inclinations, and they're all facets of the same diamond, right? United in the same faith, the same dogma, the same truths, but then how that truth finds expression, right? That's the plurality of monastic uh, um, orders, right? Active, contemplative, and so on. Uh, what is it, um, like mendicants, about the preaching orders, uh, the, 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 the begging orders. So this is the plurality that God wills, not, not, not plurality of religions, but within the one true religion, there's a plurality of expressions. That's, that's the proper way to understand that. So, um, so then our, our saints for today, the Servites, um, uh, another kind of a reform effort. So this is much later. Uh, so this is around the uh, 13th century to 1200s. And this is Florence, Italy. And there was a, a men's group there a group of seven men, and they were of the patriarchal families, these uh, established ancient families who'd been in the city for centuries and centuries. And so seven men from these patriarchal families decide, you know, things are not good, uh, it's not going well in the city, there's, there's, there's civil unrest, there's uh, decline in the, um, in the, in the uh, church, in the priesthood. Uh, what can we do about this? So they're meeting, they're praying together, um, and they decide, all seven men, they are going to withdraw from the world and begin, uh, they're just, just going to go into the desert and give themselves over to prayer and contemplation. Uh, so this is, this is quite radical. These were uh, cloth merchants, wealthy cloth merchants. And um, two of the men, two of, two of the seven were actually still married. Uh, they had wives and children and families and so on. But they all seven decide that they're going to leave their fortunes and, and everything behind and uh, begin this, this new way of life. For, um, and it was, it was in reparation. Right, for, for the city, for their country, for the church, and so on. Uh, two of the men were widowers. Their, their wives were, had deceased. Their children were grown. Uh, three of the men were single. And the two married men, uh, they, they consulted with their wives first. And uh, they made provisions for their family. But then their wives agreed. And they left. And they went into the desert. And, and they, did, they founded the, um, they called it, they called themselves Servants of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, OSM or uh, more commonly known as the Servites. Uh, the Servite order still exists today. Uh, it's not a very well-known order. We, we, we think about you know, Dominicans, Franciscans, all, all of the famous ones, but the Servites, well, I mean, who are they? Uh, they're kind of like the workhorses of the church. You, know, you don't need to be, be um, famous or outstanding or whatever it may be, just do the work. They have institutions all over the world, um, uh, schools and so on, and their charism, as was founded, is kind of like the, um, a little bit like the Redemptorists, in that uh, they are not uh, purely active, they're not purely cloistered, um, they're, they're kind of actually whatever they need to be. Um, so you, you have the cloistered orders, like the Carmelites, they, they, they give themselves entirely to God, they are, they are enclosed, they are completely separated from the world, they don't teach, they don't preach, they, don't, they just they love God, and they, are, uh, they give themselves over to Him entirely. That's the cloister. The active order, like the, um, uh, the Dominicans, they were uh, or, um, instituted to preach primarily against, against the heresies at the time, but they opened schools, they opened foundations to teach people the truths of the faith so that they would not fall away by heresy. Um, and, and the Servites, well, I would say the, the Redemptorists, the Redemptorists are cloistered, not cloistered, but they're contemplative, and they sit there and they meditate, especially upon sin and hell and death and judgment and the last things. Then they go out and they preach missions, uh, uh, based on the fruit of what they've been meditating about. So they fill themselves up with sanctity, like a reservoir, and then it spills over onto others. The Servites just do all of it. If, if nothing's needed, they'll be contemplative. If, hey, we need, we need a, a, um, a school, they'll found a school. Uh, we really need somebody to go here work at the hospital, they'll go work at the hospital. So that's kind of the, how the, uh, these seven men founded the Servite order. That's why they called Servites. What does a Servite do, a slave? Whatever he's told. So uh, a very, um, uh, uh, I would say, a practical uh, way to, to found an order. 
Uh, so these men were very well known in their day, very highly respected. They, they, they moved out of the city and they began attracting followers. Uh, they were like, we need more, um, more contemplation. They moved further into the desert. They attracted more followers. And that's probably when they, they came up with their idea, we need to have some kind of a hybrid um, uh, order here. So all seven men were buried in the same grave. Uh, they died at different times, but they all placed them in the same grave. And they're all venerated today uh, 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 on this day. Uh, they had, um, let's see, St. Peter Verona, uh, the Grand Inquisitor, his feast is coming up on April 29th. Um, he helped them establish their order. And they, they actually follow the, um, they follow the rule of St. Augustine, and they wear the habit of the Dominicans. Interesting uh, little um, combination there. One of their most famous members is St. Philip Benizzi, and they, um, they had a devotion to the seven sorrows. That was one of their, their main things, is they devoted themselves to contemplating the seven sorrows of Mary. It was already a devotion in effect, uh, but they um, instituted the uh, chaplet of the seven sorrows. If you've prayed that, that's the Servite order. They're the ones who, who instituted that. Uh, so three reformers here, St. Anthony uh, Kalias, right? Uh, cleaned up the mess from the bishop uh, left behind him, the patriarch. Benedict of, um, I think it's Agne, uh, he instituted a reform, but it didn't take, right? He tried to kind of uh, uh, homogenize all the monastic orders. That wasn't according to God's will. And the Servites, uh, their, their reform uh, lasted. They inspired people, they gave up everything, they went into the desert, uh, and, that, and that did have an effect. Um, you know, our takeaway from this, there's so many of them, but I would say it's especially, uh, don't worry about the future. Don't worry about what may or may not happen from my efforts. Are my efforts going to last? Are they gonna be appreciated? Are they even gonna take any effect? You know, we don't know. None of these men knew what their efforts were going to accomplish in the future. They just said, this is what I need to do right now. This is what the church needs. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to be generous. Uh, and, and they did it. Uh, and, and then what, what happens in the future, that's up to God. And, and so often we are actually, we're prisoners to, um, to time. Either something in the past, we keep thinking about it, going over and over it, we can't let it go. Or something in the future, we keep thinking and thinking about it, wanting it to happen, and it may never, it may never come to pass. So our goal is to live in the present right? To learn from the past and to make preparations for the future, but to live right now. Don't live in the past. Don't live in the future. Live right now. And don't put too much into your work. This is where men have the problem, is they put so much of themselves into their work that they neglect other people because they want to accomplish, they want to succeed, they want to see that, that success. Um, you know, God may be calling you to a great work, don't pour yourself too much into it. Be resigned that it may fail, right? Like the Servites or like uh, St. Benedict, right? It, my, my efforts may not come to fruition. I spend all this time on this, this Codex Regularium. It may not come to fruition. We have to be fine with that. Um, I, you know, I have to give this admonition to uh, um, also to, 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 to mothers, this idea that you're working for your children, but just like men can pour too much of themselves into their work, Women can pour too much of themselves into their children. And they think that my child has to succeed, has to do this. Oh, he's so good at this. He's got to go in this direction or that direction. Leave your kids alone, right? Don't try to homogenize them like um, Benedict Avonier did with all the monastic orders. You've got different kids. They're all going to do different things, some better, some worse. Uh, give them a basic rule and then let God, um, you know, work within them. Uh, uh, so... Um, you know, be more the Servites. You know, who knows what God is going to call them to? Be flexible. So, um, you know, a, a lot of different different lessons that can be drawn from this, from meditation, from thinking about it, from in internalizing it. Uh, but it does require time. That's the one thing. Give time to God. Give time to prayer. Uh, give time to consideration of all aspects, not just a, a narrow focus. But think about how can I apply this. Uh, you know, how can this be applied to me, my, my family, my kids, my husband, my whatever it may be, um, that's going to give God um, the, the most room to act. Often he acts in unexpected ways, right? Expect the unexpected. Uh, just be prepared for the, the multifaceted um, uh, aspects of God to be working in our lives. So um, uh, seven uh, holy servites, pray for us. Uh, St. Benedict, uh, St. Anthony, pray for us. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.